As is most often the case, it takes a tragedy to catalyze the creation of something that should have existed long beforehand, such as traffic lights, amber alerts, seatbelt laws, etc. There is a tragic story to be found in most of the safety features in our life if we take a look at their origin, and the story behind the creation of the 911 operator is no different. Nowadays we just take it for granted, and more often than not when there is a crime committed multiple calls are received concerning the same incident. However, there were not numerous calls during the murder of Kitty Jean Ovese, although dozens of people witnessed her attack. At least, that's what was initially reported. No one paid attention as the young woman was brutally assaulted and therein lies the tragic story of the murder that started the 911 emergency call line. Catherine Kitty Jean Ovese was born on July 7, 1935, in Brooklyn, New York. She was the oldest of five children born to Vincent and Rachel Jean Ovese. In 1954, shortly after her high school graduation, her family moved to Connecticut, and she decided to stay in Brooklyn with her grandparents. Soon after, Kitty got married, but the union would not last. The marriage was annulled the same year. By 1963, she had met Mary Ann Zilonko at an underground lesbian bar. The two became a couple and were living together in an apartment in Queens at the time of her death. During the murder trial, Zilonko was forced to refer to herself as Kitty's friend or roommate, due to the fact, officials felt her gay relationship would take away from the tragedy of the case. In fact, it was not revealed to the public that she was a lesbian until 40 years after her death. Kitty worked as a bar manager at Ev's 11th Hour Bar in Queens and loved her job and the patrons of the bar. It was her dream to one day own her own restaurant and managing the bar was giving her a lot of experience to reach her goal. On March 13, 1964, Gino Vesse left the bar where she worked at approximately 2.30 a.m. and began the drive home. Unbeknownst to her, someone was watching her from another car. She arrived home at 3.15 and parked her car in the train station parking lot, which was about 100 feet from her apartment. The man who had been watching her had followed her home, and he approached her with a knife in his hand. She noticed the man and began running, but he caught up to her and stabbed her twice in the back. Kitty started screaming for help, which alerted others to the scene and they began yelling for the perpetrator to leave her alone. The yelling scared the man and he left. She was seriously injured but managed to crawl inside her apartment building. The perpetrator came back 10 minutes later and searched the area for his victim, where he found her in the apartment hallway. He proceeded to stab Kitty several more times and then he engaged in post-mortem sexual activities. He stole $49 from her and left for the second time. A second call was made to the police, and an ambulance came for Kitty, but she died en route to the hospital. The front page of the New York Times, two weeks after Kitty's death, stated 38 witnesses watched the murder for 30 minutes without doing anything. But were there really 38 witnesses? Evidence suggests there were not. But after the article ran, other newspapers and media reported the same story. While some witnesses reported hearing or seeing something going on, no one knew for sure what exactly was happening. The crime took place at 3 in the morning, so most people were asleep when the attack occurred, and while a few woke up to hear Gino Vess's screams, it was dark, and people didn't know if it was a married couple fighting or what was going on. In the end, two people did call the police. An elderly woman also went outside and stayed with Kitty, holding her until help arrived. On March 19, 1964, police arrested a man, Winston Mosley, who was caught burglarizing a home. During police questioning, Mosley confessed to police that he was responsible for the murder of Kitty Gino Vesse. He went into detail about the crime and explained he had the desire to kill a woman and how easy it was to do so since they didn't fight back. He also confessed to other crimes he committed. During the trial, Mosley pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but was found guilty and sentenced to death. A year later, his sentence was reduced to life with the possibility of parole. Due to the shocking and sensational headlines from the case, little attention is shown to the perpetrator of the crimes and not much is known about his life. Mosley was born on March 2, 1935, in Manhattan, New York. He was the only child born to Alphonse and Fanny Mosley. Fanny was known to carry on affairs with several men and was neglectful toward her son. After the Mosley's eventual separation, Fanny did not want to raise her son and sent him to live with relatives in Michigan. 
Alphonse eventually moved to Michigan to help raise his son. While living in Michigan, teenage Winston was told by Alphonse during an argument that he was not his birth father. His mother reiterated the fact during Winston's trial. Winston Mosley was married twice. With his first wife, Pauline Sisko, he had two children with, before the couple divorced. In 1961, he met and married Elizabeth Grant, a nurse, and they had a child. Mosley worked as a machine operator, a job he had held for the last 10 years. He owned his own home and had no criminal record. Family described him as a quiet introvert who loved dogs. When Mosley confessed to the murder of Gino Vesse, he didn't stop there. He also revealed to be responsible for the killings of 15-year-old Barbara Kralik and 24-year-old Annie Mae Johnson. Mosley also confessed to several rapes and burglaries. He explained to the police that he did not enjoy sex with a living person. After a psychiatric evaluation, doctors suggested that Mosley was a necrophile. Up until the point of the 911 system being created, people were required to call the nearest police station if they had an emergency. The Gino Vesse case changed that. One of the witnesses of the attack saw Kitty staggering around outside and called the police to report a woman had been beaten up, but his request for assistance was ignored. While a centralized phone system to report emergencies was already being talked about, Gino Vesse's death made authorities see the importance and urgency of the system. Three years after her death, the unified 911 system was created. The bystander effect, aka the Gino Vesse syndrome, was a term coined relating to a social phenomenon where people turn a blind eye to victims needing help. For some reason, people feel that although others may need help, that the responsibility should not fall on them. Additionally, it was proved that when the situation arises, the more people to witness the event, the less likely it is for someone to reach out for help. The research done on this syndrome was in direct correlation to the Gino Vesse case and is still referenced today. Other instances in which the bystander effect has come into play include Raymond Zak and Wang Yue. When everyone thought they had heard the last of Mosley, four years after his arrest, he was back in the news again. In 1968, Mosley went to the hospital for surgery from a self-sustained injury. On the ride back from the hospital, he overpowered a guard, taking his gun and beat the guard until blood was pouring from his eyes. He then escaped from the prison van and broke into a home. When the homeowners arrived, Mosley tied up the husband and raped the wife. In total, Mosley would hold five people hostage over the course of his two-day crime spree. Following a tense standoff with the FBI, Mosley returned to prison. Mosley changed his story and made up plenty excuses for his crimes over the years. At one point he decided to tell people that he wasn't the one that killed Kitty. When that didn't work, Mosley blamed his upbringing on the crimes. While he apologized for his part in Kitty's murder, his only goal throughout his prison stay was to be released. After serving nearly 52 years in prison, one of the longest serving sentences in New York, Winston Mosley died on March 28, 2016. He was 81 years old and he was the gruesome reason you now have an emergency number to call to, in case something bad happens. Mm -hmm.